Let's do it. All positive energy. It's preparing and it, it happened. Oh my goodness, it actually happened. Hello, ladies. Welcome. Sophie Musumeci here. You are watching this on replay. I am so excited because it is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Now you might be going, so that's a really funny thing for you to be excited about. But I am because self-care is something that we talk a lot about. We talk about it in the group. A lot of you are coaches or consultants working with people who you're trying to help with their self-care and self-love and their, their health and how they feel about their selves and relationships. So this is one of those critical moments of taking a pause and actually just spending a few minutes for yourself that actually might change your life. And I've got two very special guests. Now, some of you may already know the gorgeous Tonya. So she's on my left, but however you're viewing this, I'm not sure. She might be on my right. So some of you know, Tonya is what we call our sales diva, but she is all soul, this girl. Mm -hmm. um, so some of you may have already had the opportunity to talk with her. I'm just going to make sure. Can you hear, if you can see me, can you let me know? And can you just comment on the live? And that way I can see that you can see me. So Tonya has her own story, which I'm going to ask her to uh, share with us as well. And then I'm very excited to introduce you to Rochelle, who is from the So Brave charity, which works specifically with young women experiencing breast cancer under 40. So Rochelle is here to uh, educate us to kick us up the ass around why aren't we doing the checks? Because we were all just chatting beforehand, weren't we, Rochelle? And yeah, uh, yeah. you just found out that Tonya and I don't know how to do a boob exam. Yeah, and actually, you know what, it's actually not all that surprising, to be honest, because I think people give such mystery to it. It's really not that difficult. So we'll talk about that today and, and demystify it for everybody. Perfect. Thank you, Tonya and I. Like, good. We, we need to figure out how do we, you know, yes. what, what? I don't even know. And you know what? Like, totally random thought in my head. But even as young girls, we're not actually told to explore no. our bodies. No. Mm-hmm. So mm -hmm. when I just think about that then, like, like it wasn't a thing. So you never saw your mum doing it or, you know, so it's just so important. So um, here's some facts that one in seven women will be diagnosed with brain, breast cancer before the age of 85. One in seven. And I was thinking about the average family. Say you have three kids in that family. You've got the mum, traditional families. I know, but I'm just, you know, generalizing here. You've got the mum and three kids. So if they all have partners, then each you've got at least six just in your immediate family. That means the odds are, touch wood, it's not, but one of you in your immediate family at some point. That's shocking. Yeah. Yeah, it's a scary stat. Um, that's definitely the stat that came out uh, in 2019. It actually went from one in eight in Australia to one in seven. Um, each each country has a different stat. So I know that you have some people listening in from the US. I think the US is still one in eight. Um, but yeah, one in seven. So it's uh, we're beating the world, but not in a good way. That's not one stat that we want to want to win. Hi, ladies, we can see you there. Thank you, Sharon. Yeah, let us know if you have your own story, whether that's personally or someone that you love, we'd love to um, hear from you as well. And if anyone has any questions, for Rochelle, as we go along, please ask them. I can see you in the chat. Hi, Bianca. Hi, Sandra. I can see you in the chat. So I will ask the questions for you to um, Rochelle. And, and obviously, we'll show you at the end how you can connect with her. So a one in seven or one in eight, we don't want to be, we don't, these aren't the stats we want to win. And when we, when we break that down, cancer, breast cancer is the most commonly diagnosed cancer in women aged 20 to 39. Now, I just turned 40. However, <laughs> it's in such young women. I think it's like one of these things that we think it only happens when you get older. Is that a common yep. mis... You know, 100%, 100%. That misperception is so prevalent, um, both here and abroad. Uh, doctors in particular still think that it's just something that, you know, they have to be watching out for women in their postmenopausal years, in their 50s and 60s particularly. And, and that is when a, the majority of women do get diagnosed. However, you know, I know women from 18 and I've heard of women from 15, 16 who've had breast cancer. So, yeah, when we're talking about this, it really is something that we need to be vigilant about from a very young age. And if you've got younger women in your life, to talk to them about it and demystify. But also um, there's a lot of taboo around breasts at the moment still. We don't like, like you said, oh, I don't know about touching myself. 
but it's yeah it's just part of uh, being a woman and we need to be taking those self-checks as part of our self-care very very seriously this actually even came around the dinner table right last night in the most bizarre way so Daniel <laughs> Toby was sitting without his shirt on he wasn't very, he has been sick the last few days so he just wants to wear his jocks all the time right so he's sitting around the table we're having pizza and he had just his shirt on and then Daniel was sitting there I can't remember if he had a shirt on or not and then Stella had like her dress and then I had my clothes and Stella looked at me she goes mum why is mine called a nipple but yours is called a yours is called a boob Mm-hmm. and so just like even the understanding around like I didn't even know that they were called areolas mm-hmm. <laughs> until, until my yes. husband said clearly he yep. was more into boobs than me <laughs> and he told me this was only 15 years ago I found out that there's a thing called areola like this right. is how much we just didn't talk about talk about it at all as as young mm-hmm. ones so yeah um, we've got Susan says gratefully thriving after stage three bilateral breast cancer Thank you for being here. Oh, Susan. Wow. That's awesome. Well done. Well done. Awesome. So when yeah. we look at those stats, that's a thousand young women each year, which is just around three a day. Three a mm. day. Mm. These are Australian stats, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, they're Australian stats. The stats for the US is in the thousands. So, yeah, I, I mean, I'll look that up um, before I go too much further for the US stats. But, I mean, when they talk about young women, they have organisations in the states where they have thousands of women that they're looking after just because the population's different size than ours. But, yeah, it's quite it's quite horrifying to, to think about. It's huge. And I remember Tonya and I, um, Tonya's been the team now for a year. Last week, she celebrated her one year anniversary with the Real Entrepreneur Women's team. But earlier this year, you know, Tonya was sharing with me her very deep um, emotional story of her own cancer. And regardless of whether it's breast cancer, cervical cancer, or any part of your body, this is why it's so important to take that time and putting you first. Mm. Um, Tonya, I'd love to hear from you and if you would be open enough to share with the ladies here a little bit about your story and what um, what you found was really missing out there or what it was that you needed. Yeah, uh, well, thank you, Sophie, uh, and lovely to uh, meet you, Rachel. Um, I, I suppose the biggest thing for me, I was um, 44 and I went for my normal pap smear test and in, in actual fact, I, I was overdue. So I was, I think you're supposed to well, every year or second year and I hadn't done it for a good three or four years and I know we can all fall into that trap of just getting busy. Um, and I went for this check and yeah, uh, they found um, cancer in, in my cervical. And so uh, I, I had two decisions. I had to, the doctor said, well, we can tomorrow take you in, cut you all out um, and get it out of your body. Uh, like the next day and my my husband was with me and I was just you know I hadn't even processed it um and I just said no I don't think I'm going to do that I want to just go away and do some research on what what what, what's best for me and he's in you know he was like well what are you talking about you've got two girls and I'm like I get that but I'm just going to do some research go away and do that so anyway we did a lot of research I found this amazing woman called Christine Matheson um, she has cancer to wellness. She was diagnosed with um, uh, stage four and the doctor just said, we can't do anything for you. She couldn't even go on chemo. It wasn't even, uh, she, she was riddled. Um, so she went away and in, in six weeks, got all these naturopaths, got all these wonderful people to really help support her with a diet. diet. Uh, it, was very, it was a lot of fasting, a lot of juicing, getting the alkaline state to you know, a really high percentage. So, and all just raw organic vegetables. That was it. Um, so she followed this plan and in three months time healed herself of stage four. Amazing. So I decided, well, I know I've got a bit of time here and that's the route I went. Look, it's not for everybody. I, I, I'm not saying, you know, that that's for you either. Um, we are all, you know, but I wanted to at least try it rather than having something, you know, cut out. Uh, I went down this route and yeah, I was diagnosed in beginning of November and by February I did my next pap smear and it was gone. Um, but it, I can't tell you, it, it wasn't easy. Like I, I did a six week organic, just vegetables. And then I had to juice everything for another six weeks, like no chewing. It was just juicing organic vegetables and it was liquid. 
for six weeks. One of the hardest things I've ever done, but my alkaline body, uh, with, well, what, Chris, what Christine explains is that if you, are, if you are a pure alkalinity, cancer can't grow in, um, in, in your body because it only grows with acidicness. So anyway, that, that's something that's a little bit, little bit deeper, but um, look, it, it worked for me and I'm, I'm very grateful. But as I said, um, one of the hardest things I've ever done, there was a lot of crying. There was a lot of, um, can I really do this? But at the end of the day, it was a lonely road. And I decided not to tell anyone. I, it was just kept between Jamie and I. I didn't even tell my family until I started losing 12 kilos. And I was down to, you know, what, 48 kilos when I was juicing. Um, but I, it was for a good cause. And can I say, though, oh my God, I felt amazing. <laughs> so much energy. Um, but anyway, that's the flip side of it. Uh, but, yeah, that, that's pretty much my, my story. And um, I, I suppose what I really want to say to everyone is just get checked. Just, you know, don't, don't avoid it. Avoid it because if, if I would have done another year, it, it could have, you know, gone to my breast or it could have. And now I'm every day I have that letter come, I, I get checked. So I think it's really important that we all really do that, um, no matter what cancer it is. Yeah. Thank you, um, um, Tonya. And like the chat's going off for you as well. We've got um, Sandra sharing that her mum was diagnosed with breast cancer at 60. She's now 81. Bianca said the same. Her mum had breast cancer in her early 60s. She's now 79. Thankfully, she's been clear since then. Sharon also shared that she had stage three cervical and she had it cut out many years ago. I also had it cut out. Um, I didn't even know that there was, uh, like no one told you about there's any other option. Um, and then, yeah, also uh, Cassandra said, Tonya, her mum had it and beat it as well. And that's the thing, we hear it about our mums, don't we? It's, it's mm. someone who's think it's a it's an old person thing it's like we're invincible when we're young but then we forget actually you know we are even though we still feel young we are actually pushing it up I had a beautiful friend um oh I've got shivers all over my body uh Teresa who we lost three years ago to breast cancer and um she missed the early signs she missed the late signs because she was so stubborn wasn't wasn't going to happen to her um she never made her health a priority. She put everyone else first. Like she was go, she put the whole community first, her kids, but everything mm -hmm. and didn't take that time for herself to make that a priority. And it was too late. Like by the time it was, yeah, she was riddled. Um, and so, yeah, this is an important topic, which I'm so, um, so grateful. I met Rochelle at a, an event a couple of months ago and we just happened to stand next to each other. And uh, Tonya was there actually that night. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I, yes, we have met. I didn't. I yeah. Yeah. yeah, she was with you. know why? Because we're all too busy drinking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but Rochelle shared with me some of her story, and I was just blown away. Um, and I just wanted to do my small thing today by bringing Rochelle to my community. We have a community here of over 13,000 women, and if even just a hundred of you go and get you know, you're, you're more aware and you go and get your breast checked and, you know, you take something away um, from this today, then, then this has been a well, well use of all of our time. And also Rochelle's got a whole, um, you know, she is a charity. So she has uh, ways that you can, you know, you can support her through donations, through time. Um, she's got the great calendar that you can buy from her website. I'll drop the link in. Uh, I'll just tell you what the link is now because I can't, it's just go to sobrave.org.au, um, but I will drop the link in there before as well. So, Rochelle, I'd love to hand it over to you. Please educate us. Um, share your story as well, because my goodness, your story is just incredible. Yeah. So thanks. Thanks, Sophie. Thanks, Tonya. Um, I guess I'll probably start by just talking about how I came to find my own cancer. And I, I think like most young women, we think we're pretty invincible. And I think we all, we all have this understanding that Breast cancer is only for women who either are older or they have a huge family history. What I've found and what I've always known is if there's anything abnormal with your body or if you don't feel right about something, you need to go see a doctor. And if that doctor sort of pushes you away, then you need to go ask for another consult with a different doctor or you ask for scans. Um, and that's just been the way that I've been throughout my whole life. I'm very fortunate. My mum's a nurse and most of her sisters were nurses. So we would have lots of opportunities to hear stories where 
yeah, you needed that second opinion. You needed to be a really good health advocate and to and to take some time. Um, and, you know, as Tonya was saying, she made some decisions about how she wanted to do her health care. Um, and sometimes you need just a moment to just step back and have a look at it yourself. Obviously, following the advice of of doctors is is something that I would recommend. And definitely um, when we're looking at breast cancer, there's some evidence around um, natural therapies, which isn't always positive for those women. So we really do recommend that you talk to your doctors, but for women even getting a diagnosis can be difficult. Um, so my story was that um, at 32, I was at home about to ready to go to bed and I saw a a reminder card hanging in my closet and it just triggered me to think I should do that breast check. Um, third trimester of my second pregnancy, I had no family history. I hadn't been drinking forever because I had two small children, well, not one on the way and one um, earth side with us. Um, very fit and healthy because you are when you're running after little toddlers and um no family history, as I said, and no cancer history at all in my family. So very little chance for me being young, in my thoughts, ever having to deal with this kind of issue. But that check saved my life because in that check, I felt a hard lump in my right breast. And the benefit of having breastfed my daughter was that I had gotten quite used to what my breast felt like because every time I fed, I would be, you know, massaging out so I wouldn't end up with blocked ducts or mastitis. And so I knew that there was nothing there previously. And so I turned to my husband, I said, what do you think? And he said, let's talk to the obstetrician at the next appointment, at the next appointment, um, she told me, look, it's normal fibrous tissue. You probably, you know, your body getting ready for the baby. As I now know, she should have sent me for an ultrasound. That would have found it there and then. We wouldn't have had to go down the next route. So I had my child. Henry's fantastic. Um, and I'm in the, um, the ward after having him and I'm trying to massage this thing out while he's feeding, thinking if it's a blocked milk duct, then let's get this thing out. Um, but it wasn't moving. And as I was trying to massage, I was thinking, you know, that I feel like this thing's actually bigger than I remember it. So I called my um, my obstetrician about 10 days postpartum and she wouldn't answer the phone. Her receptionist told me if I was really worried to go see my GP. So I saw my GP. My GP sent me off for an ultrasound the very next day. Thankfully, in big cities in Australia, you can just do that even before Christmas. Uh, regional Australians have such a different story and it's probably the same in other places in the world. Um, but in that particular ultrasound, they couldn't find anything. But the reason I did anything further was that they told me my results in front of everybody in the waiting room, that it was normal lactating tissue, nothing to worry about. Come back in six months if you're really worried. But their report to my GP said, come back in 12 months. If I had left it there and my GP had left it there, then I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you ladies because a month later, after talking to my mother and getting yet another ultrasound appointment, they found it, finally found it. And I was just before my six-week postpartum checkup. I found out about my diagnosis the day before that day and I went into my obstetrician in total total shock. I didn't even realise what was going on. In that meeting I'd had... In, in the hospital, they'd done the ultrasound. I'd gone for my very first mammogram and then I'd had a, a punch biopsy, a, a core biopsy to see what it was. And by the Monday afternoon, I was being told, yes, you must have known something was wrong because, yes, it is breast cancer and we'll need to do something about it. Um, and, yeah, you, your world is already turning upside down because you've got a newborn and then add that to the table and things get really interesting uh, so I went through um, surgeries um, in which both, both both surgeries, I had my son come up to the ward and stay with me because I was still breastfeeding him. And I it was really important to me that I breastfeed him. Um, and so then I was being asked, would I like to potentially have future children? And of course, I've just had a child. So I am not interested in having more children right then. I'm like literally just recovering but I went through an IVF preservation cycle to get 
eggs and embryos um, to try and see if I could have children after chemo, which can sometimes um, make you infertile. Um, unfortunately, that did not work, but then I started chemo after that. Six months of pretty heavy chemo, um, two different lines of chemo. The second line I had huge anaphylaxis from, so it was really scary. Um, and then I was also taking immune immunotherapy at Wonder Drug called Herceptin for about 12 months. Continued with radiotherapy and then hormone therapy, which I've been on for coming up on eight years. So, you know, there's lots of monitoring and stuff that happens through this. And the reason why I kind of stepped back from all of that experience about a year and a half after being diagnosed, and I was like, you know, my life has changed so much. I now have, you know, two small children. I don't want to go back to the job that I was doing. Um, what am I going to do with my life? And so I was looking at all different avenues, how I could use my skills. And I met a woman who does body painting called Wendy Fantasia, and she offered to body paint me. And at that stage, I had had all my hair fall out, of course, with chemo. And I had this disgusting, fluffy little patch all over my head. I had, you know, put on weight because of chemo and all the steroids that I'd had to take and lost part of my breast because of the surgeries. And I kind of just took it, but I didn't want to do anything with it. And about a week later, I was reading a story um, at a, a retreat that we'd gone to for breast cancer patients and their families. And it was written by a young man who'd bought his two small children. And unfortunately, the mother hadn't survived. And I thought, you know, this could have been my husband writing this story. This could have been my story. And I woke up the next morning and serendipity intervened overnight and said, okay, and I had this idea, we need to be body painting a whole bunch of young women. They will be so empowered by this experience. Um, so if you go onto our website, you'll see heaps of beautiful, colourful images of young women. They're all breast cancer survivors diagnosed under the age of 40. And as Sophie has um, explained, we actually just launched our seventh edition of the calendar. You can't really see it because I've got the blur on the background, but go to our website because they're available now and we can send them worldwide. Um, oh, yeah, so if you go to our, uh, yeah, oh, good on you, Sophie, you're coming up with the goods. That's awesome. So if you go to the shop there, Sophie, you should be able to find our, um, our calendars that have just been launched. Um, I've been traveling everywhere around um, Australia in the last, if you just click on the first one, I don't think it's quite updated yet, but it should. Yes. Oh gosh, I did that while we were talking before. So maybe I should bring up my, my screen. Oh, there you are. There you are. So that's the beautiful front cover. Um, all these young women, young breast cancer survivors diagnosed in their 20s and 30s. Um, and this is the seventh time we've done this now. So um, we do this across Australia every year. Um, and this year we went up to Darwin, uh, which is the first time ever. And it was a fantastic experience with uh, a whole bunch of volunteers and, and meetings with government and meetings with um, young breast cancer survivors and school students and all sorts. Uh, I've just, like I said, October's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So it's very timely that we're doing this at the moment. And um, I've been meeting with uh, a heap of ministers and government uh, members and, and senators this last week um, to just remind them that young women do have such a different experience and to also get some funding. So, yeah, there you are. If you'd like to get a, um, a copy, that's as easy as it is. And um, you can just jump onto our website. So, um, other things on the website that you should be aware of is uh, if you click on the burger, the drop down burger, I don't know where it is, I don't find what you need up the top there. So, if you. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. On on the mobile, it's a burger. So if you go down to breast check guide, uh, when you click on that breast check guide, you can actually download a breast check guide, a free guide on how to be breast aware. Now we're going to start talking about that a little bit ourselves now, but you can get that guide. It runs you through that, and then when you're signing up, you actually get access to a reminder 
once a month to just say, hey, have you done that check? So if you if you want to sign up for that, Sophie's just done so. Thank you, everyone. Um, I mean, that's really I'll go wonderful. I'll buy the calendar as well and I'll yes. donate at the end as well. So Amazing. Amazing. I'm just Amazing. so happy to see my credit card details when I do no, that. Probably, well. probably need I'll to stop that sharing on that bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed. But everything's on that website, so you can just navigate around there and, and have a look. But there's some of the young women that we have worked with. Um, and as you can see, all different body shapes and sizes, um, quite a lot of the women have had um, either a single mastectomy, which is the removal of an entire breast, or a double mastectomy and reconstruction. Um, sometimes they haven't had reconstruction. As you can see, poor Lisa there, she was on the public system and had to wait quite a long time before she was able to access reconstruction. That's one of the uh, advocacy points that we're pushing out at the moment. Um, but yeah, we do a lot of work in trying to push the envelope at the other end to make sure that young women aren't forgotten. Uh, in, in Australia, we just had the federal government um, release their budget and they're very excited because they've given $9.7 million in addition, um, in additional funds to uh, breast screen, which is fantastic. If you're aged 40 plus anywhere in Australia, please go book into breast screen. You can get a free mammogram and um, you know it can pick things up very early uh, which means that in addition to your monthly breast checks, which we'll go through in a minute, um, then you can also do those mammograms and, and get some early information and early diagnosis because we know that's the most important thing. So Sophie, do you mind if I take over and I'll, I'll do a quick uh, screen share of some of the things that we were talking about regarding... Yes, ladies, and ladies, please do ask any questions that you have in the chat as we're going along. Like I said, I can see them here and I'll ask them of Rochelle. And Rochelle can also jump in afterwards um, and reply yes. directly into the group. So, yeah. you know, stunning Rochelle. Um, Julie's yes. sharing about a clinic which has a great 4D image. Yeah, lots of stuff in there. But uh, uh, over Amazing. to... Yeah, Rochelle, I'm just going to, sorry, I've got to go. Yeah. I'm going to be, get back to work. Lovely to meet you. You're doing See an amazing you. job here. Thank you so yes. much for doing this. And no worries. Yeah, I think it's really important that we all are more aware and more open with this conversation. So thank 100%. you. No worries. Right. Thanks, Tonya. Have Bye. a great rest of your day. You too. So I'll just quickly run through the Smart Women of Breast Aware. And this is the, um, the campaign that we run across Australia in high schools and universities. So we you talk wanna, about you uh, go to um, screen record like uh, presentation. Oh, okay. Can I do that? Is yeah, over on the bottom right. Full screen there now. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Yep. Okay. So we talk about um, S being statistic significance. So we know that 20,000 women in Australia will be diagnosed this year and about 1,000 of those, as Sophie said, will be diagnosed in the age group of 20 to 39. And breast cancer is the most commonly diagnosed cancer in women in that same age bracket. And I think we think, like, that's quite a shock to a lot of people because we don't think of young women having that prevalence or that it's that high um, an issue, but it's actually, yeah, the most commonly diagnosed cancer far and away above every other kind of cancer. Um, and so when we talk about that, we talk about that one in seven and, and that it is the most commonly diagnosed, about a thousand young women, three women a day. Um, we talk about how we want to be doing this um, manual, monthly and mirror. And the reason when you say mirror is that um, you can't see your full breast if you're just looking down from your head down. You cannot see anything below your um, nipple, probably just below there. So what you need to be doing is standing in front of the mirror, put your hands on your hips, looking at it, seeing if there's any changes in size, shape, if there's any changes to the skin surface, moving your arms up and down to see if there's any puckering or pulling as you do that. Because if there is a tumor that would be sitting underneath the surface, what it can sometimes do is like pull at the skin as it moves. And so then you can tell. Um, and of course, everybody knows you need to get these things out. Your hands are the best best possible thing that you have at your disposal to check um, and if you've got a partner who you trust um, we've had quite a few ladies whose partners have actually been the reason that they have been diagnosed because their partners have actually found the abnormality um, and when we're talking about abnormalities everybody thinks oh, I'll, I'll give a link in the in the thing when I jump in Sophie to the Canadian rethink it's hilarious you'll all get a real laugh out of it okay cool <laughs> <laughs> when people look at this, uh, when they think about breast cancer, they think, oh, it must be a hard lump because everybody thinks of it as a hard lump. 
Mm. No, there are so many different ways. And it really is knowing what is your normal, what is normal for you in terms of what your breasts are. And so if you feel like a thickening, like it just feels heavier or fuller, sometimes that can indicate breast cancer. Um, it could be dimpling in your skin. Nipple could be a little bit crusty. Your breast could be a bit red or hot. Anything that is a discharge should be investigated, um, especially if it's not uh, milk and you're not breastfeeding. Um, and skin sores, anything that won't heal, um, a bump that's especially protruding, growing veins, inverted or sunken nipples, um, new shapes or new sizes, um, that orange peel kind of look or feeling on the skin. And then of course the hard lump. And so what we're looking for when we're doing that check, and I haven't brought them with me, unfortunately, but if anybody wants a copy, we've got beautiful waterproof shower hangers, which have some reminders on there. Um, you stick them in your shower and that's one of the best places you can do it, Sophie, because it's, you know, you're already naked, you're yeah. in there, it's private. So nobody's going to be watching you. You can really get in there and have a good feel and, and not feel embarrassed or anything like that. Or you could be laying in bed and you can do that as well. But in the shower, what you can do is you can add a bit of soap or, um, or lotion or something to your hands and it just makes it easier to sort of go around that area. And when we're talking about the area, we're actually talking about from your collarbone all the way underneath your breasts and all the way into your armpits because breast tissue actually, actually extends all that way. So it's not just these circles of breasts. We have this huge area of breast tissue. Um, and we were talking before, we don't even know what our breasts look like. And I think it was very important that we were talking about, um, you know, we I'm didn't playing with myself. Know. They couldn't see me before, but I was like, well, well, getting right yeah, in there. go for it, go for it. <laughs> Using the right terminology too is really important. Um, so this is actually from Cancer Australia. And I think, you know, when we think about breasts, it just all feels a bit lumpy and we don't know what it looks like at all. But if you think of the nipple being um, the end of, say, the best way I think about it is a cauliflower. So with a cauliflower, you've got those roots and then they go out to little flori and they come out. So that's sort of the base of something that if you think about as a cauliflower, and then you've got all of your branches that then come out to these little flori. And so the flori are all the ducts where the milk gets produced. Um, and we know that in most countries around the world, ductal breast cancer is the most common, but there are other forms of breast cancer as well. Lobular, these are called the lobules. These are the things that feed into. And, and then we have all sorts of other things that affect the skin and the nibble. Um, one of the most rarest forms is Paget's disease of the nipple. So really, if you do see anything different to your nipple, go and get it investigated. Anything to the skin um, and, and other areas, you know, there's inflammatory breast cancer as well. Um, that can also be something that, you know, you need to be aware of. So I think when you're looking at all of these different areas of your breast, what's it what's important to remember and and starting to get used to what you're feeling and looking like is to start in a bit of a clockwise fashion and in the quadrants so that you know where you're going so it doesn't all just get really confusing so starting clockwise work uh, you can't see me so I'm just going to get up I'm for a to, second I'm to unshare Stop Hello. Yes, yeah, so I'll stop to? sharing for a second so I can show you. So Let's standing see. up, I only have one breast now because I ended up having a single side mastectomy. But what you're doing is you're feeling all the way from here, right up into your armpits, all the way underneath your breast and all the way around and into your nipple. Um, and sometimes if you divide it into a quadrant, you can say, okay, so I'm going to go this quadrant first, have a real good feel around that in behind the nipple. Um, and just We're all doing this at the same thing. time, right, ladies? It's not just me publicly feeling myself up. Everyone's doing this right now watching, yes? <laughs> Getting in there. And, and I guess the thing is, if you haven't been doing this regularly, it's going to feel very weird to begin with. But um, in those cases, maybe you do want to go see your GP and just say, hey, can we have a feel? Can you show me how to do it? Um, but then really getting in the practice. So putting in your phone a reminder um, of, you know, doing that check. And I'll just quickly share the screen again so I can run through some of the ways that we do that. Good. So, so feel too. get in there, ladies. Time to yeah, get in there. 
Get your tits out, as Rochelle was saying to me the other day. I was like, what should we call this? She goes, tits out Tuesday, tits out Thursday. <laughs> I was trying not to be too crass, but, you know, we need to normalise this. So this is what I was saying before, standing, looking, lying down in the shower, raising your arms, looking for any changes. Um, when to check. This is really, really important. So um, if you're still menstruating, if you're still having a period, then you need to do it mid-cycle. And the reason that is, is because your hormones do affect the lumpiness of your breasts and there's a lot of changes that go through your cycle. The way, the best way to do that is first day of your cycle, count 10 days ahead, put a note in your diary or a reminder in your phone, do your breast check day 10 of your cycle. That's when you're going to be least lumpy um, and you can just make that a, a habit. If you're on a regular cycle, you can just pick a day of the month or if you're postmenopausal like me because of all the drugs that I've been on, then you just pick a day. So first of the month, fifth of the month, whatever day of the month that you choose, um, but keep it re regular and make sure that you continue to do it. Um, so one of the things we're doing here is raising awareness about this and we're asking each other, but... We need to talk about this. So don't just leave this conversation and think, oh, well, now I'm aware, I'm good. Ask your family members, ask your girlfriends, you know, spread that awareness. Ask your daughters if you've got daughters who are over 15 or if they're starting to develop, you know, start that conversation with them about, hey, have you ever done a breast check? Do you even know why you would need to do a breast check? Um, and maybe dispel some of those myths around, oh, well, if you don't have a, a family history, if you don't know anybody, then you don't need to worry because we all know that is not yeah. true. Yeah. Um, early detection is so important. Absolutely. And you can just go ahead and you can tag them underneath this video. So when I finish, Amazing. I'm going to tag my mum and my sister if they're not here, and I'm going to tag all of my close friends. So watch out. You're all going to get spammed. But this <laughs> That's an easy way as well is get them to watch this video too. Yeah, amazing. Um, okay, and let's keep this conversation really, really normal. I mean, we know how women have been treated and, and the way that women have been made to feel about their own bodies. We need to stop that, ladies. This is normal. This is a regular part of being a woman. They are part of who we are. We need to make sure that we're looking after them. Um, so this is a normal, regular, routine part of being a woman. Um, and then, like I said, if you're not worried, if you've found something that's not normal for you and it might not be a lump, it might not be, you know, any of the things I've said today, if it's not normal for you, please go and see your doctor. Um, and, and if you do notice anything that's not normal, go and ask for scans, ask for tests. Um, a lot of the women who I talk to are under 40 years old. They have come across some issues just regarding getting a mammogram because doctors are very resistant to, um, to refer for a mammogram. Go for an ultrasound then. And then if they find anything on the ultrasound, they might biopsy that or they might be able to do a mammogram following that. I got told the same thing that second time around. First thing she said is, oh, I see on your referral you've got mammogram, but we won't be doing that. But as soon as they found it, of course they were going to be doing a mammogram because they wanted to get more information. Um, so it's really about having a trusted GP that you can talk to about it. If you're not feeling that you're heard, seek uh, another person. Um, ask for tests, follow up on those tests. Don't just assume that because they haven't called you that nothing's a problem. So that's what we're talking about, being a smart woman. And the reason is because we want the best outcome for everybody. We know that an early diagnosis is the best possible outcome for us at the moment. And, you know, there's some wonderful things happening in metastatic breast cancer, and that's where it's spread from beyond your breast into other areas in your body. But we know that the prognosis for breast cancer um, at stage four is still ridiculously low. In Australia, it's 20% after five years. And that's a really scary statistic to think of because we know that since COVID, lots of women have either stopped seeing their GP, not done their regular checks, they haven't been going and getting their regular mammograms and other scans. So we know that there will be an increase in those diagnosed cases because we just haven't been seeing them over the last two years. And the last thing we talk about, specifically with young women, but really it's for all women, you need to be your best self-advocate. When you're talking about your health, you do know your body the best. You know, this, this doctor has trained, they're very expert, but 
you still need to be able to ask the questions and it's not rude and it's not undermining their abilities but it's truly just looking after your own health and I think that's why we do this because we want to make sure that women are able to stay here like myself I'm nearly coming up on nine years post that diagnosis I've been able to see my kids oh gosh it always catches me the kids catch me I'm able to talk about this stuff and then I talk about the kids and that that's what loses me um, but that's important you know we need to be able to look after ourselves so that we can be here for our families and so that we can keep doing all the wonderful things that we want to be doing with our lives um, so yeah I think that's where I'll stop with my presentation. But I think if you've got any questions, and thanks, Sophie, please add me in. And if I can help anyone, or if you need to reach out, just come to our, our one of our socials and, and message us. And it's likely that I will message you back with some kind of information, or at least sharing a, a pathway that you could choose to go on. But Thank you so much, Sophie, for, for sharing this time with me and, and giving me this opportunity to talk with your community. I think it is so important. Um, I did look up the stat while we were waiting there before. Um, so it's about 1,000 young women under 40 diagnosed every year in Australia, but it's 12,150 estimated cases each year in the US. So uh -huh. that's, that's a significant amount of women who are being diagnosed every year. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Michelle, and, and thank you so much for sharing your story and for doing the work that you do, you know, knowing that, um, you know, there are people out you who actually really give a shit and, um, and, you know, you're living proof that, you know, go and make that time for yourself. And sometimes as women, like it's, we, we don't put ourselves first, right? And there's always going to be something else that you need to do, right? But if you can't do it for yourself, then do it for your kids or do it for your family or do it for your friends or do it for your colleagues. Or if that's what you need to say to yourself in your head to, to go and actually get it checked, then please do. And I love what you said around being a self-advocate because sometimes our doctors are great, but every now and then there's one that's not so great and they're busy. They're back to back to back trying to see heaps of... Think about the uh, impact COVID has had on the health system, right? So they're slammed. If you know something is off with your body, you have to advocate that. And that's what you mean by that, right? It's like, 100%, gotta, yeah, 100%. don't take no for an answer. Like it's your body, you know, yeah. I, I much prefer for everyone to think I'm a psycho, <laughs> but I at least you're get not, it, right? you're not, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the most important thing. And especially for younger women, when we talk to them, you know, a 15, 16, 17, 18 year old fronting up to their GP who may have seen them since they were a kid, um, maybe thinking, oh, well, you're kind of over overstepping it or, you know, over worrying about something. But honestly, even, even younger women, we've got one of our ladies in this calendar was 14 when she, she went herself to the GP at 14. I still cannot believe her. Um, but said that she had this sore that wasn't healing and investigated and it was actually cancerous. So wow. at 14, she knew, hey, this isn't right for me. I need to go investigate this. And I think that's something that we as women, we're not good at. We're not good at making time for ourselves. We're also not good at speaking up for ourselves. Um, and I think we have to be. It's a learned behaviour. We just need to learn it and, and live it. Yeah, and I think as well for the women in my community who are, you know, coaches, consultants, healers, you've got to walk your talk, ladies. So if you're telling your clients, you know, self-care or eat well, look after yourself, like, and I talk about this all the time, are you actually being your best client? Because I'm always like, I just want to be my best client, right? So whatever I'm telling my clients to do, I'm already doing it, right? So it's the same for you. If you're telling your clients they've got to look after themselves, put themselves first and you're not and this is one just one area that you could you know get done and focus on that it's you know every month and then having the checks and going and um getting support if you need it then you're also role modeling what you're saying and that's going to allow you to be living in that full alignment so i uh, just lastly very quickly before i let you go thank you so much rochelle just a reminder again ladies how you can get involved if you've been inspired by rochelle and you want to be part of it with her. I'm sure that she'd be just not going to say no to anyone who wants to help. They've got a lot of um, different ways that you can get involved. So you can go to the website, sobrave.org.au. 
Um, and then you, you've got the menu up the top where you can click, where you can go to get dash involved. Um, there's lots of ways. So there's fundraisers, volunteers, events. Obviously, donation is great because it allows them to do what they do. I'm going to go do a big donation right now um, to say thank you very much for your time. I'm going to get that calendar, everyone. You should at least donate, get the calendar and download the guide. There's your three steps for today. Go donate. doesn't even matter if it's five bucks. 20 bucks, 100 bucks, just go donate a little bit today. Yeah. Because if we all do a little piece, it just, yeah. you know, think about it, you, you go and spend $5 on a cup of coffee. Like that's nothing, right? Yeah. What if you all just donated $5 or $10, $20 today um, and get them, get the calendar. So then we've got it yeah. around. I'm going to go get the calendar now as well. And then most importantly is make sure that you fill yourself up. Download the guide. I love that. It's so beautiful. I want to do that. Yeah, please. Oh, yes. Well, you know, we we have access to so many beautiful body pain artists. It's just been fantastic. And their artwork is just always like you think that you've seen it all and then they come up with more beautiful, incredible work like this one that they did. Um, and it's just so rewarding to see these women being able to come together and to connect as well. Because, um, yeah, breast cancer can be a lonely place. So it's nice to have people who know what you're going through to connect with. So, yeah. Oh, absolutely. And Sandra, yeah. just I'll share the message with you from Sandra. But she just said, thank you so much for sharing your journey, Rochelle, for being brave and allowing us to be brave too. So on mm -hmm. that, we're going to say thank you very much. And ladies, if you want to reach out to Rochelle, you can go through her website. Um, but also drop any other questions you have and Rochelle will come and um, answer them too. Thank you Maybe. again. Thank you so much for everything that you do and um, and for your time today and for sharing that and for giving us a kick up the butt because I think... <laughs> <laughs> yes, ladies, I'll be checking tomorrow. Did you go home tonight? Did you do the check? Yes, indeed. Great. Awesome. Right. Thanks, Thanks, ladies. Baby. Have an amazing afternoon. Much love. See you soon. Bye.